Hi, and welcome to this training video, getting your It's Learning course ready for the school year. So this video is for really any teacher in BCSC, whether you are a veteran teacher returning after we did extended emergency e-learning last school year, or if you're new to BCSC, there's gonna be a couple of tips that we're gonna go through here that can help prepare and get the right foot forward for a successful school year. So to start off, I'll introduce myself. My name is Brenny Coomer and I'm the coordinator of instructional technology here in BCSE. And the goals for our session today are to evaluate and improve your virtual learning environment. So kind of going through and thinking about if you're a returning teacher, what you did last nine weeks and how you can implement some changes or keep some things that worked really well. Uh, implement strategies to organize your course, especially now that we're using a course template is a way of kind of creating a little bit more consistency across the district to support our students and their families. And then also identify some learning tools within its learning that you can utilize to power up student engagement, collaboration, and give them more options and really further implement universal design for learning. And just as a disclaimer, I will go back and forth between the slide deck and the actual its learning platform quite often in the session. So if at any point in time you want to pause and pull up the slides, go for it. There is a document that it's really helpful to maybe even print and have handy. I like to have it on my desk so I have it as a reference, but this document is an It's Learning Course Readiness Checklist. It's a PDF. You can make a copy, print it, do whatever you like with it, but it's really 10 steps to help you prepare for the start of school and make sure your It's Learning Course is ready to go. And as you go through, you can check off those items and make sure that you're set and your students will be ready to use that course for the first day of school. So how can we make sure that our its learning courses are organized, effective, and spark learning? The first thing, basic thing we have to decide first is how do we want to organize our its learning course? Now, if you were a returning teacher in the past, you kind of had a little bit more um, options on how you can do this. You could do folders, pages, learning paths, whatever you like, and that's still something you can do now, but there are a couple of template pieces that come into play. So you have two options for how you can organize your course. You can use It's Learning folders and pages, which is something that a lot of people have used in the past. You can still continue to do that. There's just a little bit of structure there and how you can add content to them. And then the other option, the second option, is using plans on its, on its learning. And the It's Learning plans or the planner is another way of organizing resources. It doesn't mean you have to totally learn a new skill set and a new tool. It's just arranging folders and pages and assignments in a different way and it gives students a start button to start the lesson so it's very obvious and clear for them on how to start their day. So my recommendation for you would be to explore both of those options and then make a decision. So you have to pick one of those two options to get started. On this slide deck I have linked some helpful resources. Right here is a slideshow that explains to you the two different template options that you can pick from for organizing your course and really the pros and cons of each one of those. So the differences between the two. And then right below that is a video walkthrough that explains how you can access those resources and set up your It's Learning course. So what I'm going to do right now is exit out of this slideshow so you can see what I'm talking about. So if I go over to It's Learning, if you go to your resources tree, um, you'll probably have a few different content pieces in there. So I'm gonna go over to an example course here. And your course might have a sample start page and it has some pieces on it, but you might notice it's probably not what you wanna have on there as you're, as you're welcoming to your course for your students. It's just suggestions on what to include. So a welcome video, uh, maybe a message to your students typed out, access to past lessons there. Obviously you don't have any yet for the start of school, but a way to kind of plan for that in the future. And then over here is a space to add and update your teacher contact information so how they can reach out to you if they need help or if they're confused or if they're having technology troubleshooting issues. And then the resources tab in your course is where the other key pieces of that template will be. So there will be a sample lesson page that you can use to structure your lessons. If you're an elementary teacher, you'll also have a curriculum resources page. Okay, 
settings. And you do have the ability to edit this if you click three dot button and then create your own copy. It has all of your curriculum links if you're an elementary teacher. If you're a secondary teacher, you can add yours from the It's Learning Library, and I have a guide for that. The other resources that are in here is you should have a daily lesson page that you can customize and use this for weekly or daily lessons. It's really up to you. Um, it's just a lesson page template, so you can plug in your learning goal, the why behind your learning goal, uh, instructions for your students there, and a video of instructions, and then any links and tools they'll need to complete those lesson objectives. And there's also it's learning tips for students. So this is a really a helpful place if your students get stuck or they're not sure how to use some of the features on its learning. It has all these guides in English and in Spanish and also has a video. If you are someone who wants to explore using plans is the way to organize your course, you'll click the plans tab. And plans, the way that we pushed out this template and set it up for you is that these columns here are predetermined for you. That's what the template did is it gave you the headings for these columns. So you know to always include these things in your lessons. So your plan would be your lesson title. And it's helpful if you put the maybe the week or the unit, um, the day of the week there that that lesson corresponds to. Add dates here so it's obvious to the students when this lesson is taking place. Your goal and instructions here, so very similar to that page and folder format I just showed you. You'll need to have your lesson goal there and any instructions. State standards if you have those linked to your course. And resources and activities, so this is where you would add in links, pages, assignments, and things for your students to do. And then teacher notes is where you could put your teacher contact information. So really what plan says is it takes a lot of those common elements that I just showed you from pages and just puts it in this more table view format. So those are the two options that you have there. And I really recommend that you watch that video where I walk through everything so you get an idea uh, of what that looks like before you make your decision so it's an informed one. And here are a few other screenshots of what those template courses look like and how it's helpful to use those when you're planning your lesson. So other things that are helpful here, if you are wanting to use any of those course templates, which you should, you should use some of those elements and say you're wanting to edit one of those daily lesson pages or that home page and make it your own. There is a guide on how to do that. What you'll do is you'll go to your course template. You'll go to your pages. It's a page that I'm wanting to edit. And initially, when you look at this, you might not have the ability to edit any of those content blocks. So I'll click the three dot button. Let's say I want to edit this one. Maybe I need to add another link that I use specifically for my class, but I can't edit any of these pieces. So I'll click this three dot button and create own copy. And I'll confirm create own copy. And then it prompts me to refresh my screen, which I will. And once I do, this is my own version where I could add additional content blocks if I want and change or add instructions to these different content blocks as well. And that's the same for your course homepage if you're using that and the daily lesson page and resources as well. If instead you wanted to use the plans option to organize your course, you can still use that daily lesson page and put all of your resources there. And when you go to use your plan, that's the resource you add in the resources and activities column. So right here, I could use a daily lesson page, put that there, and then it's good to go. And I can also add in the assignments or other activities. And this is what the students see. So if you're using the plans feature on its learning, you'll activate your plan and click a little checkbox here and click action. And there's a drop down menu and it says activate. And what that does is it makes the plan to where students can participate in it view the resources and go through its steps. Lesson step-by-step, step. so it takes them through those different columns in your planner step-by-step. Step. All right, and this is what it looks like for students. So another key piece when we design these course templates is that students need to have access to past lessons. And that's really straightforward with plans as well. So with pages and with folders, you can always link to another page or a folder to give students access to past lessons. You can also do that with plans but students just go to the plans tab and then there's a drop down menu and by default it shows active plans for the week if they click this little drop down menu they can select 
past plans, any upcoming plans that are maybe active for them to view, so they have access to anything that they need. And here are two additional guides for using and editing plans and pages on its learning, especially the course templates. So that's the most important thing to start off is that you'll decide which, which of the two uh, course organization methods that you'll be using for your course. And then from there is where you can start diving in and really getting into making your content and lesson activities. So step three here is to create and customize content. And that's after you've done step two and decided and step one is logging into its learning. So step three is creating and organizing and customizing content. So what you'll do is you'll use the templates to kind of guide how you add your content to your courses. So always make sure you have your lesson goal, put your links and resources there. And here is a guide on how to edit the template pages, but I already showed you that. You can add content in a variety of different ways. The most tried and true tool for adding content on its learning is probably the page tool because it's so flexible. And of all the different it's learning tools that are out there, there are resource tools and there's activity tools. Resource tools are a one way interaction. So the teacher is communicating information. The students can click on things, but they're not really interacting it beyond that. It's a consumption tool for them. Um, they're not creating with it. They don't turn anything in with those resource tools. Activity tools are the opposite, where the teacher builds something for the students to interact with, and the students are actively engaged in that. They turn things in, and they're creating, submitting, turning in work, and the like. So if I am on its learning, and I want to start building content and resources for my course, I'll click Add to see the full list of options I have available. I'll click Show All. All right, so I already said that you have the templates in your course, and you can use Pages, and the page the template pages are in its learning page. That's that tool there. Um, so you can add links and resources there. But if you wanted to add a folder to organize your lessons for the week, you can click folder and give it a name. I'll click save. And then from there, I can click resources. And now I can move any one of these resources if I want into that folder. I can drag and drop over here, or I can check box those different items in my resources tab and move them into the folders. So that's one way you can create is by making folders to organize the pieces that you have there. The other thing that I can do is I'll click add and show all. And I can start building and adding more content too. So all my resources are up here. And these are those one way interaction tools where it's just something the students read, not necessarily complete work within that feature. If I wanted to build in activities for my students, I would go down here and here are all the different activity tools. The assignment tool is probably the most flexible out of all of these tools because it supports a variety of response types. So it's a way for students to turn in digital work to you. So they can type out a response, they can add a link to a Google resource or upload a Microsoft Word file if they wanted to. They can record audio within the assignment tool and it's learning and upload it. Same thing with video. They can record and insert video and they can attach any digital pictures if they have those. If I wanted to add maybe a lesson page for the day, I could also do that or add additional pages to complement my template pages. I would click add page and I would click add content block and rich content, and I can start building and adding pieces from there. And this toolbar here is probably your best friend on its learning because it's so flexible. You can add links, pictures, audio, and video within this tool, and it's called the Rich Text Editor, and it's whenever you see a content block. So that is how you can easily get started in creating and customizing content. The other things that you can do on here is you can actually copy content from past courses. So if you are a returning BCSC teacher and you know you have a lot of really amazing content and things you wanna do, but you don't have to start over and type it all from scratch, you can copy it into your course. So I can do that by going to my courses menu. And only my active courses will show up my courses menu. If I'm trying to find something from last school year, that's my archive course, it's no longer active. So I'll click all courses. And by default, only my active courses are here. In this drop down menu, I'll select archived. And now I can see any of my past It's Learning courses 
in case I want to go there and copy over any resources. So I'm going to find the one I want. And here it is. And if there's a specific resource that I'm looking to copy, I'll click resources. And I'm going to find that here in my resource tree. So let's say go to this folder, find some of the lesson here, and I'm going to click right here. If I find the resource I want to copy, and click action and copy to. And then I can select my new active course here. So in this drop down menu, it shows me it's in my current course, the things I want to copy it there. But in this drop down menu, I'm going to select my new active course. And then I can even put that into specific folders if I already have them made. So I can put that into my first week of school folder and copy it over. And I'll get a confirmation message when it's finished copying. If you have a lot of content from past school years that you want to copy over, you can select a bunch of different things to copy over at once. It takes a little bit longer to get that confirmation message. But if I wanted to copy over all of this stuff from this course, just so I have it there to work with, I can click select all action copy to and then select my active course from there. Now you might be wondering if you're a returning teacher. So I really like creating and customizing copying content, but now we have this template. What if I want to add in pieces from a past its learning page, like the page I just copied over, but I still need to make it kind of fit into that template. How do you copy content blocks on pages? It's a couple of different steps here, but it's very easy to do. So if I wanted to copy a content block page. So let's say that I want to use this as a lesson resource. So I have some content and things here, but I don't have to type all of this out again because that's going to take quite a bit of time. But I know I need to put this in my lesson page because it's a template and that's what I should be doing. I'll click the pencil button on what I want to copy. And that's this rich content block. I'm going to click the source button. And it looks really scary right there, but I'm going to copy all of this source code. So I'm going to do control A to select it all, or I can click and scroll and then copy. I'm going to cancel and close out of this. And now I'm going to go back to my daily lesson page. And I'm going to add a new content block and rich content. I type in my text box here and I still have all of that computer jarble it looked like that source code copied. I'm going to click the source button here. And now I'm going to paste all of that stuff I'd copied and you know it's the right thing if it looks all scary like this. Click source code again. And there we go. It copied over all of my content pieces. I can click OK. And now I can have all of my information from that page copied over or I could even copy over elements from the template into another existing page if I wanted to, but it makes it a little bit easier if you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I know you have some good things, but still want to make sure you're using this new course template. All right, so I kind of got ahead of myself there, but that is how you create and customize using the course template and how you can also copy over pages if you are a returning teacher and want to utilize some of the things that you've done in the past. The next thing that's really helpful with getting your It's Learning course going is just getting familiar with the Rich Text Editor. And I have a couple tutorials there. I kind of started to show you some of those different pieces, but the Rich Text Editor is really helpful for inserting video in audio and pictures. And it's really great if you add those things into your classes so your students have different options and how they can get the information and different options and how they can get an understanding of your instructions for the day. So you can type out your instructions, but it's helpful to have a video or an audio recording of you explaining those instructions too. And again, copying content. We already did that. There's a tutorial there if you want to see it a little bit slower pace. You can also organize your content too. We started to do this, but 
Folders are a great way of doing that. If you are using the plans option for organizing your course on its learning, plans are also great because they automatically make a folder for that plan. So you won't necessarily have to go through and make folders of past lessons if you're using the planner because it's doing that for you. But if you are using pages and folders is the way of organizing your it's learning course. So you're using that course homepage and the lesson page template. What you would need to do is make sure that you have a folder for your past lessons so your students can easily kind of distinguish what you're currently working on and what's been in the past. So initially the start of the school year probably doesn't look that scary, but over time, it's going to get very lengthy, kind of like what we're seeing right here. And that can be really distracting for students if they're several weeks into the school year and they see all of these different items on the resource tree and they're not really sure where they're supposed to go for the day. They might be overwhelmed and it, it could just be a really big distraction. So what you could do is just make a folder of lessons like what I did right there. And it's really easy for students to distinguish, oh, this is what we're currently working on and this is a past piece. So if I wanted to do that, I would just click the add button, show all, make a folder, and then I can add anything from my resource tree into that folder. And my recommendation would be to name them by the weeks that you're using them, maybe put the most recent ones up top, least recent at the bottom, so that your students have a really efficient visual way there of seeing what they need to be working on, what they've already done. The next key thing for getting started in your courses is making sure that your online textbook and digital resources are there and accessible to your students. So most of our classes and courses now have some type of digital piece for them, whether that's a collection of videos or it's an online textbook, you have a way for your students to get to your curriculum content through its learning. Some of those might be Google single sign on links or um, other tools. Most of those are located within the its learning library. If you were an elementary teacher, you already have a whole page of all of your curriculum links loaded in there. And you can also add some of your own pieces there if you like to use like Boom Learning or some of those other tools. In addition to your curriculum tools, you can add them. And if you wanted to copy over a specific Wonders content block, you'll use that whole source code copy trick that I just showed you a few minutes ago. If you are a secondary teacher, you might need to add in your learning resources to your course. So if you're a health teacher or C4, you might be using GW. If you're C4, you might be using Cengage. Math teachers use um, some CPM, some Kendall Hunt, some Flourishing. Social studies is a mix between Pearson and Discovery. And then science is mainly Discovery, but a few other Pearson resources there as well. If you wanted to find those resources, there is a guide that I have linked here that shows you for all the different subject areas, what the name of your resource is and how you can access it. But for 99% of these, what you'll do is you'll go to the It's Learning Library and you'll search for the name of your specific company and you can add that to your course. If you are a returning BCSC teacher and you have courses from last year that have all of those different, whether it's CPM or it's GW or Cengage or Discovery, you can actually copy that over just like you can copy over any resource from your course. So I would recommend doing that instead of going to the library, but if you're new, you might have to start here. If you have questions about your curriculum resources and digital tools, you're not sure which ones you have, I would talk with your department chair or you can send me an email and I can help clarify that. Other key thing that's helpful, it's kind of an extension of point number five here on your getting ready checklist, is adding in state standards to your class. So you might not know this, but you can link any academic standards to your It's Learning course, and it's in your course settings. So this is helpful because if you're making assessments or assignments or resources or even learning paths on It's Learning, it can help you gauge your students' understanding and mastery of a specific standard and give them the ability to progress monitor as well. So if I go to my It's Learning course and I want to add standards to this specific course, what I would do Let me go back a second. I go to my course in my courses drop down menu. And then when I'm in my course, I'm going to click the more button here across my course toolbar and I'll go to settings. 
And here I have a couple of different options, but as the name implies, I'm going to click Standards. And here is where I can import state standards. So it looks like I've already done a few, but if you don't have any here, what you would do is click Find. And then here it shows some that we loaded in for BCSC or our district, it's learning site. But if you want to go a step above that, you click this drop down menu, you can do national repository. And then there's national and state standards here where you can go through and find the ones that you need. So we'll click Indiana. And either Common Core or Academic, let's do Academic. I'm going to scroll. There are a lot of them on here, so it might take a few minutes. And here's the new social studies ones. They were revised in 2020. So I'm going to click that. I'm going to pick which area of social studies I want to add. And I can either add all of them for that grade level or I can add in specific subfolders. So for my sake, I'm just going to add in all of the grade seven standards so I don't have to keep doing this over and over again. And I'll do insert and you can do insert and close if you're finished or you can add more standards if you need to. And it takes it a second to process, but after I have done this, it's going to have the ability for me whenever I add an assignment on its learning, I can add standards to it and it just pulls from those grade seven standards. I can plug and play as many as I want. And now whenever I do or generate any reports for my students on its learning and I've tagged those standards, I can see their progress towards those standards and mastery. So that's kind of a cool piece as well. So you can add standards to your course in addition to your digital content links. The next thing that's helpful and really is a must as we discovered through extended emergency e-learning is making sure that you have a teacher presence in your course. And that's not just being there and editing and adding content pieces, but it's making your face and your presence known and welcome to your students. So that's one of the tricky pieces with teaching online is that you're not having those conversations with your students in class. It's just, it looks a little different because you're not physically in the same space. And that's why it's really important that you add in the opportunity for your students to see you, hear your voice um, and interact with you in a digital way. So a great way to do that is to add a welcome video into your course so your students know that you're there and that there's a human behind the screen and a way to say hi. So on that course template, there is a big video camera icon there to direct you and kind of guide you towards adding a video into your course. So you have a couple of options in how you can do that. You can use the rich text editor on its learning to record and upload a video right away, or you can use the, the tool um, that was free, but now we're using the paid version. So you have access to a limited version, but you can use Screencastify to add a video as well. And that's actually what I'm using right now to record this video for you. So if you wanted to have a little tutorial of you welcoming students to your course and you guide them through where to go, like if this was my course and I'm making this little instructional video, I could use Screencastify to walk them through where their daily lessons would be so they know and they always have that as a reference. If I wanted to add my video to my landing page, I would need to make sure that I have my own copy here and that I've edited it. I set it up to where I can edit and then I can add a video right there. And that's exactly what I did on this example. What I did is I clicked the pencil button and I deleted that video icon. And using this rich text toolbar, I clicked the video option. And it's probably going to freak out because I'm currently using the video to make this tutorial video for you. But I would click record and I would give it permission to use my microphone and my camera and record it there and then automatically inserts it and it looks like this when it's finished. So that my students would see me and know that I am there. So it's helpful to put that on the start page of your course. And I would recommend doing that before the school year starts. And whenever you're making daily lessons or your weekly lesson plans and you're using that weekly lesson page, just putting a short little video there of you explaining the lesson goal for the day and what students will be doing. It doesn't have to be 10 minutes long. This one's only two minutes and it just tells students whatever, all the steps they're going to complete in that lesson. So that's something else that's helpful to include. So your students not only see you and kind of have that connection with you, but they also have another option for understanding what they're doing that day in addition to just written text instructions. So adding in those personal touches and making yourself a part of your course is helpful. 
Another key thing to make sure that you include is accessible, accessible content and universal design for learning. So when you're adding content to your It's Learning course, make sure that it's easy for students to read. And when I say it's easy for students to read, that the font color and the font style are legible. So best and best recommended to use a dark font on a light background, not a neon font that can be a little confusing for students. And avoid using blue fonts in your text boxes on It's Learning because blue fonts typically signify a hyperlink, so something the students would click. And if you have a bunch of blue font there, it's hard for the students to distinguish, do I click here or is this just something for me to read? And if you're curious about if your font color that you've picked on It's Learning is an easy one to read, there is a color contrast checker here that's really amazing and can help you kind of distinguish with what's helpful there and maybe what's not. And then another key thing for accessibility is that simple solution I just showed you there. Make sure you provide options to your students, especially with your instructions. So you can have your written goal written out, typed out. You can have your instructions typed out for your students, but try to add a video recording or a short little audio recording there as well. So that some of our students who are striving readers or need to see um, and hear the information, they have the option of doing that in addition to just written text. And you can do that with the rich text editor that I've showed you a couple times. Other ways to champion UDL is making sure that you embed those options in other places as well. So if I'm having my students study a topic, maybe it's the rise and fall of the Mongol Empire in Asia, then I can have my students read a document and I can link that document there, but I can also provide other options. So maybe I embed a YouTube video that also has that content. Um, or I put in a slides presentation that has that. So they have different choices in how they can access that information. And here is a screenshot that shows you how the rich text editor supports those different options as well. And in terms of providing options in representation, like I just explained, you can also give options in how your students show their understanding. So you can use the assignment tool on its learning to give students choices in how they show their understanding. And they have that same rich text editor that is up here when they go to answer their assignments. So the assignment tool is really one of those amazing tools on its learning that's super flexible. And if there's a tool that would be amazing to master, it's probably the assignment tool because of that. You can turn virtually anything in to the assignment tool. So there's a written guide here in a video tutorial that walks you through all of its wonderment and amazingness. But if I go to my course and if I wanted to add in an assignment as an option for my students, I would click the add button. And it's the first one that comes up because it's the most popular tool on its learning. This is one of those tools that's interactive for students. It's not just one they passively consume. They are interacting with it, they're creating, they're turning things in and submitting work to you. So to get started with the assignment tool, I would add a title here. I could type out all my instructions and things there. I can add files, so from my computer or Google Drive if I have those. And I can add assignment instructions and deadlines here, state standards because we added those to our course, and decide when this is due for my students and if I want to turn on plagiarism control. And plagiarism control works on Google Docs too, so if your students are turning in a Google Doc or a slide to you, that report will also scan through those documents for you. And again, the tutorial video I link kind of goes through this a little bit more in depth, but um, you can add in those different pieces and then click Create Assignment. And now when my students go to answer this assignment, They'll click answer and they have the ability to add all those different things just like I did. They can add text here, they can add video, audio, um, they can add Google files as well. So whatever options I had as the teacher, my students have too. So if there's a tool in its learning that you want to use to really give your students a universally designed virtual environment, I would really recommend using the assignment tool. That's a great way to get your course ready for the start of school is to build in some opportunities for your students to use that tool to turn in their work. Only a few more things here in getting our courses ready. 
And there's also a guide here for using Google integrated assignments. And that's a feature within the assignment tool that allows you to send your students copies of Google Docs or slides and they have their own editing access to it. So you don't have to send them forced copies or ask them to make a copy. It makes it for them as soon as they click the resource. So make your course ready to go for the school year. If you're really getting in the groove of things and you're adding lots of content pieces and adding folders and it's starting to look great, it's helpful if you kind of simplify the way your course looks for your students by either putting it all into one folder, like I showed you earlier, but also deactivating some things. So chances are, if you are making folders for the next few weeks of school, maybe you don't want students to dive into all of those the first day of school and to jump ahead or to get into resources that isn't really what they're supposed to be working on at the moment. You can activate or deactivate content in your course at any point in time. And what that does is it hides it from your students so they can no longer see it, no longer open it. But you as the teacher still have the ability to make changes, edit, and view those resources. So if I am in my course, and let's say that I want to hide a few things, I would go to my course and click on resources. From here, I see everything in my course. And if, you, if you're noticing, I have a few things on here that are toggled no. And this shows the status of it as being active or inactive. So I'm going to deactivate this folder right here. So I'll click no. And then if it's a folder of contents, it asks me if I want to deactivate all of those. And if I do, I'll click yes. If I don't, I could go through one by one and decide, but it deactivates all of them. So my students can't see it, but I still can. If I wanted to turn this on for all of my students to see, I just click the yes button. And then we are all good to go there. And the last little helpful thing before we kind of wrap out this session is using student view to kind of get a preview of your course. So as a teacher, you have an idea on where your resources and your content pieces are, but sometimes it's helpful to get fresh eyes and to view things from another perspective. Within its learning, you have the ability to view your course as a student using this little drop down menu here. It's below your profile, uh, it's by the add button, and you'll click pupil. It always takes you back out to the very start of your course. So if you're in the middle of working on a resource, it does pull you away from that, but it wants to show you from start to finish what your course looks like. So here I am in pupil view and it gives me a little alert there so I know. And this course is set up using the plans feature. So I have a little start button there. If I go to resources, there was way more content active for me as a teacher than what I'm seeing here. And that's because some of this stuff was hidden but it's a really great way to get a preview of what your students can see, what resources they can access, what resources they can't access, so you can change that. Uh, and then it gives you a take on maybe if you wanna change things or not in your course organization. Um, it's, it's helpful if you also add in a little video. If you are using a feature on its learning for the first time or a new tech tool for the first time, it's helpful to go into student view and then create a screen recording using Screencastify and walk students through where to click so they can see where they're supposed to go. In addition to maybe having you write out the instructions they can see and hear and understand it in that visual way. So if you use Screencastify, I would recommend making a tutorial video for your students while you're in student view so they can see where to go for a lesson, especially if it's learning something new. And the last little piece is here. So we did our student view. is to ask for help. So if you are wanting to learn a new tool and it's learning or you're not sure where to start, there are lots of resources out there. You can check out the BCSE Connect It's Learning course. Everyone gets added there. It's our professional development course and there's lots of resources, anything from CPR classes to Google to It's Learning. So if you go, there's a big It's Learning icon in that course and it's accessible through your courses drop down menu and you can see guides for any and all the tools on It's Learning. And then there's also a blog that we have in BCSC that has technology tips, but also it's learning tips. And if you subscribe to that blog, whenever there's a new post, you'll get an email. And then you can also connect with your UDL facilitator in your building. They are there to help. Uh, they have it's learning administrative rights, so they can go into your course and check things out, give you a perspective on how your course looks or give you ideas to implement UDL further in your virtual learning environment. There are some bonus fun 
tips and resources here. And these came from doing extended e-learning. We learned a lot and we learned what worked and maybe what we had room for improvement for. And if there's a resource that's really helpful for your students, it's learning and adding in different pieces like um, checklists for students. So they know what they're supposed to be working on that day. And you can add those in using the assignment tool in Google Sheets. So there's a tutorial here that shows you how to do that. If there's another tool that you wanted to learn how to use, it's learning paths. So learning paths are step-by-step -step lessons on its learning and they guide students through at their own pace. So you can take a whole folder of resources on its learning, make it into a learning path, and then it goes through every single one of those folder items at the student's own pace. And you can put in tests within those learning paths and it gives students different outcomes based on how they perform. And there's a guide here as well for that. So at this point, you can pause the video and kind of get to planning and tinkering with things. And if you have questions, let us know. And thank you for joining today and learning how you can get your It's Learning course ready to go for the start of school.